The most important day of the combine has passed. And boy, was there a lot to take in. The quarterbacks threw, the running backs ran, and the wide receivers set records. What does this all mean? And what's the deal with tampering? We're going to talk about all that and more here on a special combine edition of The Real Forno Show. by Tyler Fornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire, writer for the College Football Network, publisher of Substack Run In Shooter, host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Small. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special episode of The Real Forno Show, talking about day three of the NFL Scouting Combine. I'm your host, Tyler Fortis. With me, as always, is producer Dave. And let's jump right into it, because there's quite a bit to get to. We'll start with the running backs, because they went first today. And uh, let's, uh, let's just be real. This running back class isn't very good. And a couple guys stood out in a big way. And another stood out in a not-so-good way. So let's let's talk about some of the things that uh, stood out in a good way. Um, let's talk about Jalen Wright, Tennessee running back. So there were rumors that he may, you know, get into the four twos. And no, he didn't end up getting into the four twos. But what he did do is I think he ran a four three eight forty. I think that was the time. And you could just tell that he's got explosive speed, but that get off just was not very good in a track setting. Luckily, he doesn't need to worry about that in a track setting. He'll never really have to run a track setting ever again. Because once you get in the NFL, track speed is great, but you don't have to have that track background in order to be fast on the field. So I think that's important to note. He was very good, and that explosiveness is great. We'll see how well that's going to translate on the field. Because we've seen so many guys who are fast that do absolutely nothing. We're going to talk about another one later because we set, finally set the 40 yard dash record after years of trying since John Rosh said it in 2017, it finally happened. Oh, Hey, my wife's on and she's watching from Mexico, watching from Cancun. Hi babe. Enjoy, enjoying a chocolate martini. Mm-hmm. Well, hello, Caitlin. You should be drinking t- some tequila. Yeah. Odie is not happy that we are up here right now, but he's doing good. He's a good boy. He'll he'll be okay once we get back onto the couch. And let's let's have a conversation about some other guys. I thought it was a really big for like some guys, if they don't want to test, I get it. I respect everybody who, who chooses their own path with this thing. I thought it was a big mistake that Braylon Allen didn't test, and I thought it was a big red flag because there are already real questions about his speed. And yeah, Odie just peed on the floor. Oh, good boy. <laughs> good boy. Yeah. He he's Hello. Yeah, he, Jay Christian. yeah, he's a welcome. He's a good boy, but that he's I mean, he's he's hurting a little bit because no, oh, they, they think he has an he has a neck strain. And well, on a Frenchie with how they're built, that can be really painful. So we'll we'll get him downstairs as soon as I can. Speaking of getting uh, hurt, Anthony said Cody Schrader got hurt. Yeah, I think he pulled a hamstring on his uh, uh, 40 attempt, and that's why he didn't end up testing, which, look, we saw that a bunch yesterday, too. That's just going to happen. It You're not just doing, like, normal drills. You're, like, doing stuff that's, like, super explosive. When you use super explosive things with muscles, they can pull. So that's – it sucks, but I think that was the only injury today, which is a massive positive compared to what we saw yesterday. So with Braylon Allen, I was just, I thought he should have ran, but I think he didn't want to run because it would have been higher profile. And I think he's going to run like in the four sixes. So when I watched his film the other day, I came away very disappointed, very disappointed. Why? Because I just didn't see him utilizing great burst, great vision. And I thought he was, and he wasn't good when it came to catching the football 
Like there were just so many little things. And then he didn't, he struggled in the drills. So I thought he had a poor combine and not running, I think was just kind of the icing on the cake here. But then like, we'll see. I think if he goes to a team like Baltimore and they just use him on first and second down, I think he can be really, really good. But yeah, um, Dan, I know peeing on the dog floor is not good for a dog, but he's sick. He's hurting. So I'm going to give him a break. Yep. He's hurting a little bit here. He just, he just yelped. So he, he's struggling to get comfy. So we're going to, we're going to take, make this one a little quick. Okay. So let's talk about receivers. Cause running back that that was pretty much it. Um, Bucky Irving is an interesting one because I thought on film, he looked really athletic. He looked explosive and then he just wasn't, he wasn't explosive at all. He was like a 25th percentile athlete for the position which I found very fascinating. So that's something I'm going to have to look at here in a little bit and try and match. Okay. Why didn't he look athletic? Why wasn't he? What's the disconnect? And I think that disconnect is going to be able to tell me the answer on what Bucky Irving actually is. So <clears throat> let's go to quarterbacks. Uh, only a couple ran the 40 Spencer Rattler, uh, Austin Reed, Keaton Slovis, who ran a four, five, six, by the way, which was, fascinating absolutely fascinating and then sam hartman who was the only quarterback to run in that first group and then had to like catch his breath and then go right away again ne never seen that before in my life so it, it was absolutely wild to kind of see uh but the quarterbacks i thought threw overall pretty well and it was it was interesting uh to kind of watch um i thought bo nix was Eh, he was Bo Nix. He was just average. I thought Michael Penix was slinging it really, really well. Joe Milton's got a rocket, but he really can't do much in the intermediate. So it, it's fun in a, in a, like an all-star kind of setting like that was, but he's just not a quarterback that you can actually like, I don't think you can develop him considering what his history is. I mean, we've talked about Joe Milton before, but quarterbacks, it's really tough. You just kind of want to see consistency. You want to see, Hey, are they taking coaching? Like when they miss, um, and then how does the ball look coming out of their hand? Because some of the nuances, like when you're running routes, is a little bit of a struggle. And when it's a little bit of a struggle, like it, I struggle in this way. If you get five people running an out route, they'll all run it differently. And because they're all going to run it differently, how is a quarterback supposed to throw with any form of consistency? <laughs> to me, that that's kind of the tough part. But... um I do apologize, guys. Um, my dog is struggling right now, so I'm going to wrap this up here in just a couple of minutes because I can't I can't have him being super uncomfortable up in my office. I just can't do it. So let's talk about the couple elephants in the room here really quick. Xavier Worthy, 4.2140 yard dash. Incredibly impressive. The fastest 40 yard dash ever recorded at the NFL Scouting Combine, and he was awesome. He didn't do any of the field testing. He didn't need to. Um, I thought his film was borderline worthy of a first round pick. And it sounds like that might be the direction that he ends up going in. Um, and then Romo Dunze, not as athletic as he might've tested um, based on some of his previous testing times, but incredibly smooth. Everything he does looks effortless and I commend him. I thought he was awesome. I thought he did. Uh, he was even staying late after practice, Dave, um, he was staying late and trying to get a, I think it was under a six, six or six, four, three cone. And he didn't have to, he just wanted to keep beating his time and beating his time and get to a certain point. So I thought that was really impressive. The work ethic was truly remarkable. Um, what do you kind of see Dave as uh, I'm going to kind of shift focus. I'm just going to bring all this downstairs and then we can keep going and we don't have to kind of okay. speed run this. So I, I'll leave and I'll come back. All right. You do that and we'll have him right back. We'll switch screens real quick. What I saw, what I found interesting was uh JJ McCarthy. I thought JJ McCarthy today threw a beautiful ball for the most part. Now, our good friend of the show and good friend Luke Braun talks about how he flips his foot out a little bit and that causes sometimes the ball not to go exactly where it needs to go, but that's coachable. So 
I loved what I saw from J.J. McCarthy. I may be falling in love, getting a man crush on him. He may be my draft crush, but we'll see. It is looking like, from what I am hearing and seeing, he's going, he could very possibly be taken in the top three picks, which means either Drake May, Caleb Williams, or Jaden Daniels falls. One of the three would obviously have to. It's going to be interesting to see which one of those did it. Now, I looked, Penix throws a beautiful ball. I got to agree there. Uh, Milton's uh, bombs. To be able to fire that ball almost 80 yards, that was amazing. It was it was something to be seen, and it was fun to watch, as well as where these 4 2 one run. Got to see that. That was sweet. Do you know that's equivalent to running 24.41 miles an hour? That is amazing. Most That's world-class sprinting, world-class. Now, I did see some guys, or I saw one wide receiver have a hard time. Ran a decent time. It was like a 4-4, four, four, something like that. But his back foot did a, a hop every time he came out of, the, out of the stance. And I know that slowed him down off the start because doing a track start is tough. And like Tyler said, these guys aren't going to do that in football. That's not the way we play football. It's only now, so we'll see. Jonathan, you think JJ is a perfect fit? I can tell you right now. I want. I so want to hear JJ throws deep to JJ for the touchdown. I can't wait for that. I think that would be very, very good to see. And the fact that he was came in surprised on his measurements. He came in a little bit heavier than we thought, and a little bit taller than we thought. That was then was. Then that what was listed prior. So that's good. I don't know who the Vikings are going to take. I have no idea. Kirk Cousins could be back. Or, yet again, he may not. I'm going to save this for when Tyler gets back. But we're going to talk about what Kevin O'Connell said today. It's going to be interesting. Joe Milton is Dante called Pepper off wish. Anthony, that's funny. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Norsefius says, I know we need to jump up to at least five. Norsefius, I'm afraid you may be correct. It's going to be interesting to see how high the Vikings push to get up there if they do indeed push to get up there. Now, of the other quarterbacks that were out there, there's nothing that stood out that made me, you know, super duper excited. But, you know, if we have to settle for Penix, we'll settle for Penix. If Knicks, we'll settle for Knicks. Uh, Rattler will settle for Rattler. It's, it is what it is. But I think we're going to get a new quarterback this year, and that will have us all excited. The <laughs> Jonathan talking about the old ponder traumatic stress disorder needs to go. It does. It absolutely does. But that was, was the right and the wrong move because we needed a quarterback, so... Spielman took it. We need a quarterback now, and you should draft a quarterback when you need a quarterback. That's part of how this thing works. You want to do that. Will you hit? We don't know. That's that's a crapshoot. So you keep trying until you do. And hopefully they will, because if they don't, it gets everybody fired. But if you stay the same, it gets everybody fired. <laughs> I mean, so you got to take the chance. Uh, just like they had interviewed the GM for the Bills. They talked about Joshua Allen and how he had to trade up twice, I think it was, to get the capital to trade up again. Oop, there goes my camera. To select Josh Allen. And they and he said that uh, it was either going to be a good choice or he was going to get fired. And it turned out that it was a very, very good choice. Now, Tyler's back with us. I was just talking about how the GM for the Bills was interviewed, and he had some mm -hmm. unique words, quotes, about having draft up to get Josh Allen and whether it was going to be successful or not. You know, it was he had to do it and it had to work or he's going to get fired. So he went ahead and did it. And the Vikings are probably yeah. going to be in a similar situation. Yeah, I agree. And I, I apologize if my audio sounds a little rough. 
but that's uh it's we're in a much different space down here but uh Odie is doing much better being able to lie on the couch i think he's got really bad anxiety right now from the whole thing being sick and hurting and but being comfortable on the couch i think is better. <laughs> oh that's not helping uh and and it's not her fault uh he just he's he's used to her coming home and he's always weird around bedtime when she's not home and it's just me and i think he's the same when like i'm not home and it's bedtime and it's just her so well it's not often so uh when she comes back i think he's gonna be just fine but he's a rap yeah he was doing he was doing great um like just like, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes before we went on. But I think going back up there and then him having to get comfortable, I think he's just, he's just dealing with a lot. So we'll be okay. Um, yeah, the, the uh, Brandon Bean stuff, spot on. Nobody cares what you paid if you hit. It only matters if you miss. So you better be sure. If you're going to trade that kind of capital, you better know. And if you know, then it doesn't matter. It does not matter at all. And if the Vikings gave up three first round picks, but let's say they take Jaden Daniels, Daniels hits, who cares? Matter. Yeah. It worked. Hell yeah. Let's go. So that's kind of my theory on it. Uh, and yeah, uh, we'll kind of find out. Um, what else did you talk about in like the five minutes that I was kind of transitioning downstairs? I was just talking about how. I was impressed with J.J. McCarthy, uh, how I thought Penix threw a nice ball today. Um, the long yeah, Penix bomber. looked really good. He looked really good. And I think the important thing when it comes to the discussion about Michael Penix as an NFL draft prospect, Dave, reports came out, and it was from Ian Rappaport, that the medicals look good. And when you have multiple injuries and multiple surgeries, it could be really bad. It, but – Looking good, I think, is a fantastic sign for his draft stock. I think it's a fa fantastic sign for anybody who likes him as a quarterback. And let's just be honest here. The Vikings may really like him as a quarterback because of uh, how he likes to attack and how he likes to throw the football. But he also doesn't throw in the middle of the field that often. I think some of that's due to the offense that he played in. And I think I, I don't necessarily know if it equates one-to-one -one that he doesn't want to throw in the middle of the field. But is when he was throwing the outs – on the out drills, he was dead on. Mm -hmm. Even across his body, he was dead on. Oh, which was sweet. and and you talk about the docs giving him a clearance. That's all thirty-two teams have the opportunity. All their doctors mm -hmm. have an opportunity to look at him. So that's good news on yep. for him. We all still worry about Sam Bradford knees, but yeah, it's what? you know that's the thing knees are weird knees can somebody can have two acls and everything's fine somebody can have one minor injury and it just crushes everything knees are just funky like that a lot of it just has to do with structural integrity the cartilage like there's just so many little nuances that are different for everybody mm -hmm. so i'm not gonna say hey he's gonna have Sam Bradford where, knees. who has yeah. arthritis in their you know family tree and all that sort of stuff it all plays in mm -hmm. so panics having that I thought it was awesome. Uh, I think it's really important for this draft class, especially because there are a lot of teams who really want that quarterback. But a lot is going to change based on the free agent market. Let's kind of get into that. And then we'll do a little bit more on wide receivers because I thought a lot of guys had really, really important days. So one of the big things with this wide receiver class was it was very deep. And you mm -hmm. obviously had Worthy as a French first round guy ends up running that 4 2 1. I had him as a French first round guy too. He's currently 16th on my board. I thought there was more nuance to his game than just speed. The speed is obviously tremendous, but when you look at everything all encompassing, I thought he ran with more nuance in his routes than I was anticipating. I thought uh, he could really snap off uh, and stop really quickly to be able to change direction. And he's not going to break tackles. He's 165 pounds, but I thought he evaded tacklers really well they and a missed some, tackle is a missed tackle they showed some game film of him with uh, the tracker lines and showed just that how he could stop on a dime and change direction and loop and the defender went right by him yeah 100 percent. it's it was really fun to watch him but he has issues with his hands so 
he's not like a surefire guy. He's not like Jalen Waddle was just different. He was Tyreek Hill. That's the close the, the closest you'll ever see to an actual Tyreek Hill. He wasn't quite as stocky, but he ran really impressive routes, was really explosive with that speed vertically, horizontally, however you wanted to kind of deploy him. And he's not that, but he's also not like a Ted Ginn where Ginn's just going to run straight and he's going to be a good returner. He's kind of somewhere in the middle. I don't really have a good comp for him, but that's kind of what we're talking about here as far as who the player is. I thought just a really, really impressive athlete, and that time was really good today. Another guy I want to talk about is his teammate, Adonai Mitchell, who I have 11th on my board right now. I'm very high on him. Uh, traditional X receiver with some real explosiveness. Ran 4-3-4 in the 40. And he doesn't just run with uh, that extra gear vertically. He does a really good job on in-breaking routes, out-breaking routes. And he didn't have a lot of after-the-catch opportunities because his bread and butter is, I'm going to just beat your butt. And I can <coughs> get the ball on contested catches. I can get the ball on dig routes. I can do this, that, or the other thing. But what what I don't have a lot of because of that is yards after catch. I don't necessarily think he's bad at it. There just haven't been a lot of opportunities. And there's questions about how good he actually is at it. Because when there's no opportunities, Dave, it's hard to gauge how good you are at something. And that that kind of goes across the board. And that's a big thing with the J.J. McCarthy evaluation. He was never trusted to be the guy. And if you're not trusted to be the guy, how can I believe that you're going to be the guy for me? The few times he was actually asked to do that, he played pretty well. So it's a very small sample side by that discussion. But hey, there is real talent here. And I think this wide receiver class is excellent. And we're not even done talking about some of these guys because, Dave, there were some awesome players. Uh, Jacob Cowing at 5'8 and 3'8, 168 pounds, ran a 4'3, 940. At Ricky Pearsall at 6'1, 189 pounds, ran a 4'4, 140. Uh, somebody noted on Twitter, I think it was Brandon Olson who hosts Locked On Gators. The same time as Percy Harvin. And Ricky Pearsall is not Percy Harvin as far as an athlete, but he's great with the ball after the catch. They used him on reverses and jet sweeps a lot, and he had multiple touchdowns off of that. He had like an 80-yard one against Eastern Washington. This year he had like a 45-yard one against Missouri. They had one against South Carolina. Like Pearsall can do it all. He was catching everything that was thrown his way this uh, week at the Combine. He – has arguably the greatest catch of all time. Uh, the catch against Charlotte where he's in between three defenders, jumps and almost does like the Air Jordan pose in midair, catches it with one hand. And then the second he hits the ground, he gets smashed by a safety. I think it's better than the Odell Beckham Jr. catch. I've gotten some real pushback on it. But if you're doing that and you're getting that kind of hit on the other side of it and you come down with it, I'm sorry, it's, that's better. Um, the Beckham Jr. catch had more publicity, obviously, to Sunday Night Football, Cowboys, Giants. In that game, Florida played Charlotte, and Charlotte stinks. So, <laughs> but yeah, Pearsall's done a lot for his draft stock, probably pushed himself from like a round four guy to maybe early day two. Pearsall is a really good complimentary receiver. I think he's a, he's a high-end wide receiver too, not necessarily a wide receiver one, which is fine. Not everybody's an alpha. Not everybody's a Justin Jefferson or an A.J. Brown. Not a lot of those guys exist. But if you can do some of those things where you can be a true complement, like I don't know if Addison will ever be that alpha, but for sure he's a really good wide receiver too. He's a really good complementary piece. And if he develops into that alpha, that's great. You have two of them. Nobody's going to say no to that. That's rocks. But Addison right now with the Vikings has settled himself into a really nice role and he's proven that he can do it. And with a full off season in this offense with uh, Jefferson working out, trying to figure out how to be a better pro and learning from some of the things his rookie year, you could see an even better Jordan Addison next year. And he's going to be the number two guy because Hawkinson may not play until November. Hell, he may not play at all. So those or things all play in September. We don't know. 
I don't think he'll play in September at all because he had a surgery on the like the 24th or 26th I, of I January. Agree, but that's just yeah. I think that having the surgery that late puts his like return date around Halloween at mm-hmm. earliest because it's like a minimum of nine months. So it, it's that part's going to be fascinating to see how they kind of approach. And th- this is more of a, a broad offseason discussion. And we'll do we'll spend some time next week previewing free agency, but. When it comes to that kind of broad discussion, Dave, it makes it more difficult to have some of those conversations because you don't know how things are going to parse out. But at the end of the day, to kind of circle back, Ricky Pearsall showed a lot today as an athlete, as a genuine receiver, and I was I became really, really impressed even more with his game, which is also funny because I thought he was not very good at Florida last year. I'm like, maybe this guy will be a day three guy next year. Well, he stepped up in a major way. His role changed at Florida, where while he was there, he – I'm trying to think of how to best describe it. He be, he became more of the I'm going to count on you guy this year, where the role in his offense became, hey, you're going to get a lot of opportunities for yards after catch. You're going to get a lot of screens, a lot of drags, a lot of slants, the opportunity to just catch the ball and do something with it instead of last year – where it was more trying to attack down the field and the intermediate levels because the quarterback change and the quarterback change was not just the a person. It was also a type because Anthony Richardson was significantly different than Graham Mertz. They, the play styles are different. How they want to win is different. How you can utilize their arm talent is, and legs are different. So Pearsall's uh, role in the offense also shifted as well. And I think that's helped him a lot. Um, let's talk about, uh, I don't uh, Keon Coleman. I think Keon Coleman is a really interesting guy to talk about in this class. I didn't love his film and I, it's not that I don't think he's talented. I think there is a lot of talent for him, but the big thing with Coleman, he's not fast in a traditional metric sense. He is a bigger guy. He's, I think he's around 220 at six, three and He's going to run just a few routes. He's going to run like the slants, the hitches. You may be able to get him on overs or go balls. Like, that's it. He's not going to turn. He's not going to run successful digs and out routes. You're going to ha- He's going to have a limited route tree in the NFL. DK Metcalf has a limited route tree. Nobody's saying DK Metcalf's a bad receiver. But not everybody can play like DK Metcalf. Not everybody is like 6'4", 230, with legit sprinter speed and the ability to knock you out with one punch. That's Metcalf. He's a very unique anomaly in the National Football League. So watching Keon, I'm like, I I just don't see him winning with that alpha kind of style. And I thought he was less impressive at those contested catches than I was expecting based on live viewings. But then he jumped 38 inches in the vertical. He had a good broad jump. I think it was close to 11 feet. And then his... 10 yard split was 154. His 40 was 462, but that 10 yard split, somebody put it to me really interesting, just having some conversations. When you run and you play a game like Coleman, you're running and playing in bursts. So if your 10 yard split is 154 and you're playing in like those 10 yard burst kind of segments and that's how you win, that can play. I still think, like for me, he's still wide receiver 10. I don't think he's going to be like that alpha, but I think he can be really good. So we'll kind of see how, how those things end up shifting over the course of the rest of the draft cycle, because now that the combine is pretty much done for everybody, but specialists and offensive linemen, now is when you're going to have those kind of tier discussions. Okay. I know what kind of an athlete this guy is now because I've seen the testing and now I can parse out the film with more data. And that's important. Taking a look at your evaluations with this testing and either proving or disproving certain uh, questions you had coming out of the film. And if something's completely off, like Bucky Irving, I thought was a really athletic player on an overall level, not overly fast, but I thought the quickness, the cuts, the burst was all really good. And then he tested like crap. So now I have to ask myself, okay, do I still believe in the film where all that is there? Or do I deflect then to the athletic testing where it's like, okay, there, I missed something. 
And that's going to be the next question I have to ask and try and figure out because those things all matter. And I'm very intrigued to kind of see what that ends up looking like within my evaluations, because those are really important questions. And that's how you should be using this data. You should be using it to ask yourself those questions and answer them and try to be right. The goal is to figure out what the actual answer is, not form a narrative and do everything you can to not make that narrative correct. Sometimes your narrative is wrong based on what you've known because there's new information that comes out and you have to adapt, you have to change. And that's something that I work really hard to try and be, uh, try and adapt with that new information. So Bucky's gonna be the guy I put back under the microscope and try and figure out, well, is this Kyron Williams where he was, well, hold on, is this Kyron Williams? Where Kyron Williams was like a 36 percentile athlete and everybody's really down on him. He ran a really slow 40 and just looked incredibly unimpressive in drills. And then he goes out and I think he scored like 15 touchdowns this past year for the Rams in year two. Or is it a situation where, hey, he's just not a good athlete and the stuff on film was was deceptive. Not not a lie, but deceptive. Where it, he was doing it against some lesser competition and some of the there were some variables that you just weren't able to account for. So those are questions you have to be able to ask and answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christopher says Bucky has game speed and not track speed. There's both play into it. Yes. You talked yeah. about burst. We we're always taught by coaches is it's a 60 minute game game, but you're not playing for 60 minutes. You're playing for six seconds at a time. And then between then you could rest. He wanted a hundred percent effort for that six seconds. And that's, you learn to play that way and you could do that. And, in the military, if you want to get in shape, you did what's called interval training. And it's the same thing. You go all out for a while, and then you cruise and jog, and then you go all out and cruise and jog. Football's very much the same way. You can go all out for six seconds, and then it's jog to the huddle. And then do it all over again yeah. throughout the game. That happens. Now, it was said here, uh, Giatano, Amato the Potato, said... Uh, or not Mateo the potato, but Gim- Giamato said both the cornerback and the wide receiver classes are deep. Yeah. I, I especially saw it in the wide receiver class, and that is good for the, your Minnesota Vikings because it might mm-hmm. mean we pick up some way ha- somebody halfway decent in like the fourth round, which mm-hmm. usually doesn't happen. Now, the Vikings have been lucky to do it with wide receivers, and more and more wide receiver, receivers are coming out more and more polished. So that's that's good for football. But it isn't like the tight end class where it's going to be a low year on those boys getting drafted. So that's a good thing. No, it is. It is 100% a good thing. And this wide receiver class could end up, and I've said it many times before, you could end up finding a Stephon Diggs in this class because it's so deep. And just the one thing that's difficult about evaluating talent, a guy could be a, let's say it's a second round grade, Mm -hmm. but if you have 15 other guys who are above him, so he's wide receiver 16 theoretically, and he's got a second round grade, that guy can slip around four or five because at a certain point, a team may not want to take two wide receivers early because they don't want to do, they don't want to, put that kind of heavy investment into one position. So then that guy ends up falling because other teams like, okay, it's not a need. And this guy's higher on the board and he is a need. So we're going to take him even though the value's there. And then that's how a guy like Stefan Diggs can fall. Puka Nakua. When that happens, it, it is what it is. And you just get to be the beneficiary of a really good talent falling way farther than he should. So, there really could be guys taking around four or five who are really big contributors this year and figure it out and are really good contributors long term. Right. And, and, and I was about to say, there's the late bloomers that come in that look, hey, they were decent in college. They get drafted in those later rounds, then suddenly something clicks in the NFL and they take mm-hmm. off. And Stefan Diggs was one of those. Yeah. Absolutely. So 
those are the, a lot of the receivers. One more I want to talk about, and then let's kind of wrap this up here, Dave, because I don't think we need to talk about running backs. Um, the one that I'm going to get eyes on tonight mm-hmm. after this and um, making sure Odie's good with his food and stuff is Isaac Garendo of Louisville. He transferred from Wisconsin. He's going to be a very weird player. Dave, he ran a 4'3", 340 at 223 pounds and jumped out of the gym. Would it shock you if I told you he never started a game in college? Mm, not necessarily. As that's, a four-year player, he didn't start a single stuff. game in college. That's track stuff versus football stuff. Now that makes me question how how well does he play football or who was well, ahead of him? At, uh, well, one of those guys was Jonathan Taylor. And then he was behind Ches Malusi. And Braylon Allen, who at 17 years old, exploded and ran for 1,200 yards that, as a 17-year-old. And then he ended up at Louisville, where he was behind Jawar Jordan, who's also a really intriguing prospect in this running back group. So it's he's had a fascinating story, and I'm intrigued to get eyes on him to try and figure out how much of that is just the guys in front of him, how much of that was him. Because some of it's him. If he's not better than those guys, then that's also something you need to understand. But when you test like that, at that size, now we're cooking with some gas and now we have to try and figure out, okay, what's the rest of the profile look like? How do you X, Y, and Z? So those are the kind of things I'm going to be asking when I make that evaluation. But there's not a whole lot with this running back class to talk about. It's not great. Um, But let's kind of get to the creme de la creme because during the first group of wide receiver 40-yard dashes, Kevin O'Connell joined the broadcast. Let me tell you, initially it was boring, but then it got real juicy. And it was fascinating because he directly alluded to tampering with Kirk Cousins. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read off the first quote, which uh, the Vikings Twitter account ended up tweeting. And they tweeted uh, like a full minute and a half clip. Uh, And he said, I know Kirk is going to go through a full process. He's a process guy. And hopefully we continue to be a strong part in that process and we figure out a way to keep him in the Minnesota Viking. I don't know about you, Dave, but that tone in how he kind of delivered that message and some of the um, verbiage before and after, I think O'Connell knows he's gone. Well, some of the before is I've had a blast coaching him. And then the after is he has the right to be a free agent. The Vikings aren't the only team that wants Kirk Cousins as their QB. Now, where I disagree with you on the tampering is he's under contract with the Vikings up until the 13th. They can talk Mm -hmm. to him all they want. Well, no, Dave, it's not about them. It's about other teams because that's what the quote alludes to. And let me read it. So, oh, yeah, um, that other teams he, are interested. Yeah, he said the combine gave everyone else an opportunity, whether they're supposed to be or not, to maybe have some conversations. Now, that's the that's the beef of the quote. And there's a little bit after that, but it doesn't really add a lot of extra context. What it does is strengthen the point that within the context of that quote, Kevin O'Connell's alluding to other teams having already talked to Kirk Cousins and the roundabout way with where we were at at the beginning of what the conversation was, Dave, where I think he believes he's gone. This is strengthening that point because I think the Vikings have already been given what the number is from other teams through Cousins representatives, and they're not going to be able to match it. This is a theory, okay? Based, I'm trying to read between the lines here. So it may be completely wrong, and he resigns tomorrow. Like, we don't know for sure, but the best we can do is read between the lines. So the one thing about tampering, Everybody does it. The Vikings do it. Everybody. If you have, let's say, Justin Jefferson's uh, representative, but then they also represent Christian Wilkins. Well, guess what? You're going to talk to him about Jefferson's contract and be like, hey, great conversation. Oh, Christian Wilkins. What do you think? Like, And try and get some baseline numbers. That happens all week. So it's kind of hypocritical that Kevin O'Connell mentions it. I, I don't have any direct proof that the Vikings are tampering but I can tell you they're tampering because that's what every team does. But just because you're hypocritical doesn't mean you're wrong. So if Kirk Cousins was actually tampered with and they have legit proof other than just a, an offhand, like 
conversation brought with an agent, then you might be able to file a, a complaint. A grievance. The tampering team could lose a draft yeah. pick. Yes. But it well, is... it could be that you have to give that draft pick to the the new team. Like, because I remember the Eagles and Cardinals with Jonathan Gannon, they actually traded draft picks where the Cardinals end up getting a third round pick and like a sixth in exchange for a fifth, something like that. I don't know. So like, I, it's, but the, he said nothing about the, the Vikings talking to other teams. He just said Kirk Cousins, that other teams have interest. And the Vikings have people out that are listening. Each team does. Well, it's not wrong for the Vikings to go talk to another team about Kirk Cousins. It's wrong for another team to go talk to the representatives of Kirk Cousins. That's where the tampering comes in. It's not a team-to-team thing. It is a team to player or a team to agent or a player to agent, player to um, player. That's the tampering. It's not like if Kwesi Dofomensa wanted to call up like Matt LaFleur and be like, hey, what do you think about Kirk Cousins? They could have that conversation. But you can't have that conversation is if you're Matt LaFleur. We're just using Matt LaFleur as uh, a guy uh, on another team. And he can't call up Mike McCartney, the agent for Kirk Cousins, and be like, hey, how much is Kirk Cousins going to cost? We're interested in signing him. You can't do that until next, uh, Monday the 11th. So it's very interesting kind of how this is all unfolded mm-hmm. for O'Connell, for the Vikings, for Kirk Cousins. But we're going to continue to have even more information on this stuff because this stuff is going to come out. It's going to be detailed. And we're going to learn a lot more about a lot of different things. Swerve 95, you said six measly picks this year. Vikings have nine. Total. Was he so talking far. about how many Kirk Cousins threw? <laughs> I, that, I, I, I don't, don't know. <laughs> that I that don't number know. might have been six. Um, um, but now it's going to be interesting because... Everybody knows that the illegal tampering period starts, well, generally with the All-Star Games, but specifically with the the Combine. And it's then the legal, the legal t- tampering starts on the 11th and goes through 48 hours until the new league year starts on the 13th. That's why when the new league year starts, you suddenly get, and so-and-so signed a $60 million contract, and it's only, you know, if the new league year starts at three o'clock central and it's like three Oh two. So they had everything already wrapped up prior, which technically they're not supposed to do, but that stuff happens. And the NFL turns a blind eye. They know what's happening. Mm -hmm. They just don't want it egregious and don't want it underhanded enough where it's harming competition levels across the board. Yeah. But so, what's the big deal for the Vikings is if you want Kirk Cousins to stay, he's got to go out there in that 48-hour window between the 11th and the 13th, the start of the new year, league year on the afternoon of the 13th. He's got to go out, test the market, find out what people want, and decide to come back before the well, new well, league wait. year. Yeah, well, he's already going to have all that information on the 11th. Right, because there's the illegal tampering period. But what's the legal tampering period? That's what he's got. That's the official time to gather. Atlanta offers him this. Denver yeah. offers, Dave, that's, offers that him starts, that. That starts on the 11th, Dave. Right. And now he's got 48 hours to make up his mind. Okay. Yeah. Or if the 13th and we hit the new league year and we hit that, that $28.5 million rolls into the cap this year, that dead money hit, and you can tell the Vikings aren't going to sign him back after that. They're not going to pay whatever mm-hmm. money on top of that. Mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be fascinating to kind of see what happens with Kirk and what happens with everything Minnesota Vikings. But keep an, keep your ear out and just remember this. It, it, it's Remember media literacy, Okay. Who's mm-hmm. telling you this? Why do they want, why are they telling you this? And who wants you to know this? So 
if you know that uh, a source is tied directly to the Minnesota Vikings, well, that's probably coming from inside the building. Why do the Vikings want you to know this? Or if you know a source is directly tied, or not even necessarily the source, because guys like Ian Rappaport have sources everywhere. It could be how it's worded. Why do they want you to know this? It's like politics. Democrats and Republicans do this all the time. It's about spinning a piece of information to get your specific narrative across. So just when you hear things, keep that in the back of your head. Why do they want me to know this? And why do they want this uh, per, or perpetuating the media sphere? Why do they want me to believe this? That's a question you have to ask yourself. And that's a question you have to be aware of when having these conversations, because it's it can be difficult. It can be annoying to try and parcel this data out, but it's important. It's very important. And it's going to be a very fascinating next 9, 10, 11, 12 days because, oh, buddy, there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. There is a lot going on. Jeremy asks, besides Davenport, are we looking at any other edge help in free agency? I suggest that after we get past tomorrow, the final day of the combine, and you alluded to it, we start looking at free agency as it rolls up and because we'll have a little over a week until mm-hmm. then. And we can discuss, are there any edge rushers out there worth targeting on the Vikings? A hundred percent. And it's going to be, there's, is it really deep edge group? I don't know who the Vikings will want to target. I don't know. Cause it sounds like the Vikings are from a couple things I've heard, and I'm not a hundred percent sure this is factual, but let's have the conversation anyways. They don't believe Daniel Hunter is a true game wrecker where game wrecker being like, they don't believe he's in the, on the same level. of Miles Garrett, TJ Watt, they believe he's a tier below that and they may not want to pay him because of it. So we'll find out. But if they don't re-sign Daniel Hunter, there are other players that they can go get. And it's not going to be all hope is lost. It'll suck because Daniel's really good, but it's not going to be abandoned ship, abandoned ship. We're drowning. So we'll uh, we'll continue to kind of take a peek, continue to see how this is going to evolve and adapt. And we will be here throughout the entire process because last year we started this YouTube channel on the first day of free agency. Why? Because we didn't plan far enough ahead. But this year what we're going to be able to do is go live pretty much any time a signing happens and be able to have conversations about all of them. And there should be a lot of information coming out, a lot of players being brought to the Minnesota Vikings, whether it be a re-sign or a being signed from another team. There could be trades. We could be talking about an in-depth trade on, like for NFL draft picks, because the Vikings, hey, they just acquired the third overall pick. What does that mean? And then we get to talk more in depth about quarterbacks for the next couple months. So we're going to have a lot of great stuff here for you. I appreciate you being patient while I was dealing with my sick little boy, Odie, and me trying to wrap up the show in three minutes and then coming downstairs (laughs) and Dave holding the fort for me. So we greatly appreciate you guys. We had a a record here tonight. I saw 152 people watching live. We have never gotten that high. And I, I, Dave and I thank you greatly for joining us tomorrow. Important notes. There will be a two old bloggers at its normal time. Four o'clock. Yep. As far as when we will discuss the offensive line and specialists, that is to be determined. Um, I do host a wrestling podcast, and tomorrow is AW Revolution, which is also Sting's last ever match. And I'm sure you guys have all seen Sting at some point in time. He's 64 years old. He's been wrestling since the mid-80s. And <laughs> I, have to, I have to watch that for that show. So we will at some point be doing a show either tomorrow or maybe Monday morning as like a special extra. So keep an eye out for that. And this is why yeah, you have to. Tomorrow's the big round bellies on the mm-hmm. offensive line. Yep. This is why you have to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Ring the bell is so important because we will go live at, we will go live quickly. And being having that bell rung is going to send you the notification that we are going live. If you can't join live, that's okay you know there's an episode ready to rock for you whenever you have the time. 
And that's why we always ask you to hit that bell because we want to see you live in the chats and we want to be able to have those conversations and communicate with you because it's just as important to us as it is to you. So thank you guys very much for joining. Ring that bell, like the video, comment after the live stream is done. If uh, anything that you want, because the live comments don't show up like the other comments do, everything helps the algorithm and it's all free. Mm -hmm. So free. Th thank you. For, yep. Thank you very much for joining here tonight, guys. I'm Tyler. He's Dave. I'm going to go take care of the sweet boy and you can, you can kind of take a look. My wife will kill me, but there, there's the Obi. <laughs> And yeah, Skull Vikings, puppy. everybody. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!